tuned into Quick Charge, the high voltage podcast bringing you the top stories in electric vehicles and sustainable energy daily. And it's all powered by electric. Welcome to Quick Charge. It's September 25th, 2024. I'm your host, Joe Boris. Today, we're going to start things off by talking about the biggest electric car company in the world, BYD. They just rolled off their nine millionth NEV off an assembly line with 1 million new energy vehicles built in the last three months alone. This past March, the automaker celebrated its 7 millionth NEV build, followed by a record sales month in July that included 342,000 units delivered. By August, BYD had surpassed the 1 million sales mark for 2024 with no signs of slowing down. And today, BYD is celebrating its latest production milestone, 9 million NEVs built by rolling a 1,200 horsepower Yang Wang U9 hypercar off its assembly line in China. Of the 9 million builds to date, BYD says 1 million came in the last three months alone, having built a Dolphin EV at its Thailand plant as its 8 millionth build on July 4th. Such quick output clearly showcases a bolstering of production in tow with its growing staff, portfolio, and markets it is selling into. From January to August of 2024, BYD reports selling 2.3 million NEVs, a 29.9% year-over-year increase. While BYD continues to grow in size and brand recognition, the Chinese automaker still has not shared any plans to enter the U.S. Instead, it's working on a massive production facility in Mexico and previously shared its intentions to begin selling EVs in Canada. However, that was before our neighbors to the north matched the Biden administration's 100% tariff on Chinese vehicle imports. Regardless of those tariffs, however, in the EU, BYD is still finding success in the markets despite lower profits from those higher levies. While it gears up for North American market entry, fans the U.S., BYD continues to bolster its fleet of car carrier ships for international markets. Now, if you're not familiar with those car carrier ships, you really should be because they are incredible. Earlier this month, Peter Johnson wrote, BYD prepares to unleash its second 7,000 car carrier to fuel its global EV expansion. The 7,000 vehicle vessel, dubbed BYD Hefei, is the second car carrier the company has revealed. BYD introduced its first, Explorer Number 1, back in January, which has already completed two European trips. However, the BYD Hefei is the company's first car carrier that it owns itself. The Explorer 1 was actually built for China International Marine Containers for its partner Zodiac Shipping. BYD will add seven more such vessels over the next two years to secure its spot in the global EV marketplace. And they really mean they're going global. Not only is BYD looking to build cars in Mexico and sell them throughout Central and South America, as well as Europe and Asia, but they're also going into Africa. BYD launches the popular Dolphin, Seal, and Otto 3 EVs in Kenya through a partnership with a local Toyota distributor. So they are really trying to be everywhere. And even though they're talking about the U.S. as something that they're not actively engaging in, don't forget that BYD has a manufacturing facility in Southern California, but it doesn't make passenger cars. It makes heavy-duty vehicles, Class 6, 7, and 8, not only semi-trucks, but also electric transit buses and school buses, as well as heavy equipment all the way down to forklifts and material handlers. So BYD is already in the U.S. It's just that its electric passenger cars, its light-duty vehicles, aren't here yet, but it seems like it's only a matter of time until that happens. Now, Moving on from BYD, another really important player in the EV space, Ford. Ford executives say that most drivers don't realize the major perks of EVs like charging at home and skipping the lines at the gas station. In Automotive News Congress, Marin Jaja, COO of Ford's Model E EV business, said one of the company's main priorities is tackling false beliefs about electric vehicles. Quote, that's the conundrum for us as an industry, Jaja said in Michigan on Tuesday, adding, we have customers who are fearing lost and misperception of value of EVs. Ford is working with its dealers to educate customers with tools like Ford University to counter EV misconceptions. Introduced in May, Ford's new tool is a digital and video-based dealer training platform with games and AI to educate both employees and buyers. Now, this echoes a previous article from Jamie Dow published earlier this month. 
Ignorance of how EVs work is holding back uptake. That's according to a survey conducted by YouGov, which shows that belief in persistent EV myths is holding people back from adoption. While most petrol car drivers or ICE drivers scoring two out of 10 in a quiz about understanding how EVs work. So definitely a lot of work to do there. If you're online, you're seeing people posting negative things about EVs, posting wrong information about EVs, things like the power generation is dirty, things like the batteries degrade too quickly. All of that's nonsense. We know it's nonsense. The one that's my favorite nonsense is the one about tire wear, as if internal combustion vehicles or diesels don't have tire wear. Total ridiculous nonsense. So be sure to call that out every time you hear it. And while we're on the topic, be sure to vote this November if you're in the US. Now, Moving away from Ford, this is another major player in the global EV space, and Hyundai has launched its first chassis cab electric truck in Korea for $42,000. The chassis cab EV work truck was launched alongside a new special high top model, rounding out Hyundai's ST1 lineup. A company official said that the ST1 is a business platform with a variety of expansion possibilities, although the first models were designed for delivery and logistics. The platform can be tailored to various purposes in the future. Powered by a 76.1 kilowatt hour battery, the electric work truck can drive up to 203 miles on a single charge. Hyundai's ST1 chassis cab is about five and a half meters long, two meters wide, and two meters tall. It starts at around $42,000 and prices do not include government incentives. And if you're looking at this Hyundai ST1 thinking that you might have seen it before, you've been paying attention because we just wrote about it a couple of days ago. Iveco announced a new electric cargo van in Europe, and the question I asked was, will it come to the U.S. as a Nikola? This company, Iveco, is best known in the U.S. as the OEM behind Nikola. They manufacture the trucks and semi-chassis that Nikola then repowers or in some cases, just rebrands for sale in the U.S. And earlier this week, they launched their new entry into the two and a half to three and a half ton medium duty commercial van segment with this vehicle called the E-Movie, which is based on Hyundai's ST1. The Iveco version leverages the Hyundai's 800 volt architecture, meaning the E-Movie supports ultra fast 350 kilowatt charging and V to X V to grid functionality. So it can be used to back up a job site, supply power to workers, or even power a home, presumably. We've known that a commercialized Iveco version of the Hyundai van, which prior to today has not been sold as an EV, has been in the work for some time. And Peter wrote about it in 2022, way back in February. We're going to have links to that in the show notes. But the question I want to ask everybody watching this is, with a similar profile that Iveco has in the US, which is to say that zero, they chose to partner with Nikola to better market their products in the US. It remains to be seen whether or not something like that could happen again with Hyundai, which is not known for its commercial vehicles here in the States. While at the same time, just about everybody in the commercial vehicle space knows about Nikola, good or bad, they still have more of an awareness towards Hyundai. And the idea that an American brand, even if it's not an American made vehicle, could be out there with something like this, I think would be huge. I think would be tremendous competition for the Ford E-Transit. And uh, hey, I'd love to see it. Let me know if you would like to see something like that in the comments as well. As we're coming to the end of our show today, obviously I like to finish off these episodes with conversations about sustainability, conversations about renewable energy. Today is going to be no different. Tripling renewables globally by 2030 is doable, says a new IEA report in this great Michelle Lewis article from last night. A new International Energy Agency IEA report roadmaps how it is feasible to triple renewables and double energy efficiency globally by 2030 quote, with the right enabling condition. At last year's COP in Dubai, nearly 200 countries set ambitious goals to accelerate the transition away from fossil fuels, aiming for net zero emissions by 2050. The UAE consensus, as it's called, triples global renewable energy capacity and doubles the rate of energy efficiency improvements by 2030. According to the IEA, if the goals are met, global emissions could drop by 10 billion tons of harmful carbon by the end of the decade. But hitting these targets isn't going to be automatic. Countries need to make key policy changes to make the renewable transition a reality. According to the report, quote, from taking stock to taking action, how to implement the COP28 energy goals. Calls for an aggressive push to build and modernize 25 million kilometers of electricity grids by 2030. That's enough to wrap the globe 600 times. 
It also highlights the need for 1,500 gigawatts of energy storage, including a 15-fold increase in battery storage. The IEA's report serves as a roadmap for turning climate pledges into real action. Countries will now need to translate the UAE consensus into updated, nationally determined contributions under the Paris Agreement. If governments get this right, the next decade could be a tipping point for clean energy, with renewables becoming the dominant source of power globally. And of course, if governments get this right is the key thing. So get out there and vote this November. If you're one of these guys who has complicated feelings and doesn't want to vote for anybody because different people have different values than you, guys, getting out to vote in an American style democracy is not about granting somebody your undying faithfulness or your total perfect love, right? You're not doing that. You're not voting for someone because their views and ideologies match yours exactly. What you're voting on is what the landscape for the policy debate will be for the next four years. And if you want a landscape that is driven by people who want to censor you, by people who want to punish you for speaking out against those policies, you know who to vote for. And uh, if you like what you're hearing, hey, get out and vote this November, like, and subscribe, do what T-Swift tells you.